tonight I want to talk about um, the essence of existence. And the essence of existence as defined by the Buddha includes three things. One is dukkha, which we all know, suffering. And the other is anicca, or impermanence. And we all understand dukkha and anicca pretty well. I think most Buddhists do, and even non-Buddhists who understand Buddhist teachings understand dukkha and anicca. But does anybody know what the third one is? So there's dukkha, anicca, and anatta, or non-self. And what is non-self? We just chanted about it when we did the Song of Zazen, right? We talked about that ego delusion. We, tra we talked about true self is no self. Um, but it's a hard concept to grasp sometimes. And because of that, people get hung up on it. And they... Um, It stresses people. And in Zen, sometimes we, we talk about this no self as we just did there in the Song of Zazen. And we, we confuse it sometimes within our own traditions. Um, and so I want to talk about what the Buddha meant when he said non-self. Because sitting in front of you today giving this lesson is Tom Daniels. There's no question about it. That's... That's, that's who's talking to you. And I see you guys sitting out there. I see Marion and Larry and, and Val and Oscar. And I know you guys are there. There is something there in front of me. But what the Buddha was trying to teach is very similar to um, that emptiness, that sunyata that we chant about when we chant in the, uh, the Heart Sutra every week. And so the Buddha has often described that non-self in terms of impermanence and in terms of voidness or sunyata, emptiness. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about. So I want you to, to imagine to yourself right now, there's been a beautiful rain shower outside, still a little bit cloudy, the sunshine's beating through the clouds, and you look out across your yard and you see a rainbow. Has anyone never seen a rainbow. We've all seen rainbows before, right? Everybody raise your hand, show me. Yeah, I've seen a rainbow before. Okay. A rainbow doesn't last forever, does it? What creates the rainbow? Mist in the air, a little bit of mist, not a whole lot, but a little bit of mist in the air. Sunshine going through it at the right angle, creating a refraction of the light through the droplets of water to create the effect of a rainbow, right? Isn't that a rainbow? And yet, two feet away from it, there's still the same mist, but not quite the same sunlight coming through it. We don't see the rainbow. Sometimes we see a double rainbow, right? You guys have seen double rainbows before. So that light kind of goes through and hits a couple of different places and two rainbows show up. But five minutes later, the rainbow's gone. But when all of those elements, the right light, the right amount of humidity or moisture in the air, uh, the right amount of clouds still sitting out there creates a rainbow, we call what is created a rainbow. But all the rainbow is, is all of these elements in the right place and the right time that create something that we then give name and form to. And we call that a rainbow. That's the self. The self that the Buddha teaches is that those five skandhas, when they all come together, we create a self. It's that whole thing together creates a self. Now, what, what is the debate there? Because one could argue very easily, well, if I was born blind, I would not be the same self I am today because I would have never seen all those things you created the experiences that I did or deaf or whatever. There would still be something there. There would still be a self there, right? I mean, there's a, there's an entity there, but it is not the same as it would have been 
had I been able to see my whole life or been able to hear my whole life or whatever. And so all these things come together to create a, this concept of self. But the Buddha teaches us that those things aren't really us because none of them are eternal. None of them are inherently, um, they're all inherently sunyata. They're all inherently empty because they don't exist outside. That self of yours does not exist outside of itself. So what I want to do, too often in Buddhist literature, we only have stories about male monks. I got a story of a bhikkhuni that I want to share with you guys because she really figured it out. Uh, and then we're going to discuss it just a little bit. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see this, the Vajira Sutta? And I can't see you, so somebody just say yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, awesome. So the Vajira Sutta is about this bhikkhuni, this monk, female monk uh, named Vajira. And so it's pretty short here, and I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, and then I want us to discuss it because there's some really cool things that come out here. So setting at Savati, then in the morning, the bhikkhuni Vajira dressed and taking bowl and robe entered Savati for alms. When she had walked for alms in Savati and had returned from her alms round after her meal, she went to the blind man's grove for the day's abiding. Having plunged into the blind man's grove, she sat down at the foot of a, foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the Bhikkhuni Vajira, desired to make her fall away from her concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse. By whom has this being been created? Where is the maker of the being? Where has this being arisen? Where does the being cease? Then it occurred to the Bhikkhuni Vajira, now who is that that recited that verse? A human being or a non-human being? Then it occurred to her, this is Mara the evil one who has recited, recited the verse desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in me, desiring to make me fall away from concentration. Then the Bhikkhuni Vajira, having understood this is Mara the evil one, replied to him in verses, why do you assume a being? Mara, have you grasped a view? This is a heap of sheer constructions. Here, no being is found. Just as with an assemblage of parts, the word chariot is used. So when the aggregates are present, there is the convention of a being. It's only suffering that comes to be. Suffering that stands and falls away. Nothing but suffering comes to be. Nothing but suffering ceases. Then Mara the evil one, realizing the Bhikkhuni Vajira knows me, sad and disappointed, he disappeared right there. I like this sutta because how many of you have ever sat in meditation before and thoughts pop into your head like, what am I doing this for? Or, wait a minute, where, what do you mean there's no self? Or, and I think most people of, of any religion have always asked themselves, where did I come from? You know, where, where is this thing I've been taught all my life? I have a soul. Where, where is that soul come from? You know, we all ask these types of questions, sometimes in meditation, sometimes when we're just laying in bed, sometimes when we're driving and we just have these thoughts pop into our head. That's what happened to Vajira. One could argue one way or the other. It doesn't really matter. There wasn't a, there wasn't a, Mara, the god that came, uh, the, the god of, of death, as they call him, that came to talk to her. These were, these were thoughts that popped into her head that she attributed to the evil one because they were trying to lead her away from her concentration because these were thoughts that were trying to, um, to befuddle her and to help her lose her insight. And yet she gained insight by hearing those questions in her head. And the insight that she gained, to me, was a great little uh, simile that she gave. And that is, just like you have a chariot and all the parts, you got the wheels and you got the base and you got the rails and you got the... Only when they all come together do we call that a chariot. Otherwise, we call it a wheel, and we call it a base, and we call it a platform, or we call it a this, and we call it reins, and we call it... But when they all come together, we call it a chariot. 
And that is a perfect analogy into the Buddha's teachings for what a self is. Only when the aggregates all come together do we have a being that we call self. But when they're separate, we don't call them self. And the Buddha would ask his monks, basically, uh, well, I, actually, I'm going to share that with you in a moment. But um, do you see the construct that she's given here was the same construct as I gave you about the rainbow? The rainbow didn't really exist until all those parts came together. The light, the rain, the moisture, um, your vantage point, because if you're on the other side of town, you may not see it that way, right? Um, and so only when all those things come together do we give it that name and form, rainbow. And so that's what the Buddha taught was, was um, restrictive to all of us, is that we gather these names and forms and when we create these names and forms then this idea of self begins to create when we have a name and form and we call it hunger we say i'm hungry i am hungry right we say uh we hear a name and form and we call it music and we say oh i don't like that kind of music i don't like that kind of music oh I do like that kind of music. It's all things that we have attached name and form to that we then identify with ourself. And yet, in and of themselves separately, that music is not me. The fact that it entered into my mind or entered into my ear and my brain deciphered the notes and the keys and the, and the sounds, only when I give it a name and then I decide whether it's pleasing to me or not pleasing to me, do we then internalize it and say, this is the self? Oh, Tom likes X kind of music. Tom likes jazz. Tom likes pop music. Tom likes punk. Tom likes country. Tom, Tom me, I, this is what I like. But it's only when these things all come together. Separately, there is no I. And that's what the Buddha tried to teach. And so... Uh, I have another sutra that I, uh, that I want to share with you um, where these questions kind of come up. And uh, so bear with me as I, oh, wrong one. Okay, so yeah, I hope you guys can see this. This is the Anatta Lakana Sutta or the discourse on the non, not self characteristic. Again, it's not. Good. So it's not non-self, it's not self. And this is why, this is kind of what I wanted to, uh, to, to talk about a little bit. So just to give you a little background here. You guys all know about when the Buddha first sat under, the, or after his uh, basically a week of sitting under the Bodhi tree, and he attained his enlightenment and, and his liberation. And he said, who am I going to teach? And the first people he thought were, I'm going to teach those five dudes that I used to sit in a cave with and starve myself to death. Those guys are the closest to understanding this as anybody. So he had these five buddies that he wanted to teach. And this is one of those discourses that he taught his five buddies during those, during those first three weeks of his ministry. So, um, so this is how this one goes. As he's teaching them what, what not self is, what this anatta is. Thus I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Benares in the Deer Park at, Is at Isipatana. There he addressed the bhikkhus of the group of five. Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they said. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, form is not self. Were form self, then this form would not lead to affliction. And one could have it, and one could have it of form. Let my form be thus. Let my form be be not thus and since form is not self so it leads to affliction and none can have it of form let my form be thus let my form not be thus and so he then he goes through this exact same this isn't this is not self when he talks about feelings so when he has these dots the translators did it this way so it goes like this bhikkhus feeling is not self and then it comes back up here where feelings, self, then this feeling would not lead to affliction, and one could have it. 
<coughs> excuse me, of feeling. And then he does the same thing for perceptions, term, determinations or volitions, uh, and then consciousness. He goes through the exact same thing down here because consciousness is not self. Where consciousness self, then this consciousness would not lead to affliction and could and one could have it of consciousness. Let my consciousness be thus. Let my consciousness be not thus. And since consciousness is not self, so it leads to affliction and one can have and none can have it of consciousness. Let my consciousness be thus, let my consciousness not be thus. So let me stop that for a second and come back and talk to you guys so I can see you. So what the Buddha is saying here is when he's talking about form, it can be any form you're talking that you wanted to talk about, but I think he's talking about bodily form here in this in this instance. And he's saying if form was self, then you could say I want my form to look like this because you would have control over it. And this was the, again, this was the way that um, religionists taught form in the days of the Buddha. And so that's why they believe that form, I, I mean, they believe that self this was an eternal, um, like a, an eternal soul that you would continually be reborn, but you would be reborn in basically be the same person again right this was the eternal self <clears throat> excuse me and so this is what the buddha was trying to teach again was that you can't because if you could do that then you can control everything about you and you can't control everything about you you, you don't have that kind of power and so uh, these things come into being by our experiences by the way we live and that is where it creates the self not this inherent, long-lasting, eternal concept of what a self is. So what, that's why the Buddha went through this. If, if there was a self, you could tell yourself, self, I want to be a handsome model, and I wouldn't be a middle-aged, bald, fat guy, because I could control it. I could, I could have power over it. I could have power over my thoughts. I could have power over my consciousness. I, but the Buddha says, we don't have that kind of power. And so because we don't have that kind of power, we don't identify those things as becoming self. Um, so let me go back then to that. So then he gets into this impermanence. And this is where I think you'll see that it is very similar to the Heart Sutra that we chant. Um, because emptiness and self go hand in hand. Or this emptiness and not self go hand in hand. So after the Buddha had gone through basically the five skandhas and said, is this self? No, it's not self. Then he goes through this. And so he, he starts with the five skandhas again and says, is feeling permanent or impermanent? Well, of course, it's it's impermanent. Uh, is perception permanent or impermanent? Well, of course, it's impermanent. Are determinations, and here volition, volitional uh, concepts, are these permanent or impermanent? Is is consciousness permanent or impermanent? And, and so then the monks answer him, impermanent, venerable sir. Now, what is impermanent, pleasant or painful? Painful, venerable sir. Now is what is impermanent, what is painful since subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this is I, this is myself. No, venerable sir. So the Buddha kept trying to, convince, to, to teach them that because these things are impermanent and constantly changing, all they do is eventually lead to suffering. So again, we have these three characteristics of existence. We have impermanence, suffering, and not self. And that's what the Buddha always taught. And everything kind of fit into those teachings. Where do these things come from? They come from, these, from the uh, 12 dependent origination uh, concepts, right? Um, clinging leads to birth, birth leads to old age, old age leads to death, all these things. All, one thing, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect leads to the other. And so because these things don't exist inherently on their own, they are empty under the, under the Nagarjuna 
uh, Heart Sutra, Parjnaparamita Sutras concept. Uh, and the Buddha taught them as impermanent. So these were, these were concepts of the time that the Buddha was trying to explain to people that at the time, everybody kind of believed in suffering and everybody kind of believed in impermanence. You can't live life and think that things are permanent. Not really. You might think there's a self, but that's what the Buddha was trying to teach them. Even that self that you identify is not permanent. And that's what we chant each week as well when we're chanting the Heart Sutra. So the Buddha frequently encouraged people to, to, to meditate on this idea of not self, to meditate on the idea of impermanence, to meditate on the idea of suffering. Because when you fully understand those things, then you understand the nature of being. And then you understand that all of these things really just lead to suffering. And until we can let go of that idea of self, we never really let go of suffering. And that's what the Buddha was trying to teach. All of these things, if you think there's a self, it's going to lead you to more suffering. And only when you drop that idea that this is me, this me is going to live on. I'm going to die and I'm going to be fertilizer under my flowers. Or I'm going to die and I'm going to be reborn as a queen of England. Or I'm going to be whatever. That When you drop that sense of self, you drop the suffering that gets associated with that sense of self. And that's what the Buddha was trying to teach people, was to drop that concept of suffering. Um, if I could just go one more time back to this, back to this sutta. So again, as you read this, you see, you see a lot of these same concepts that come out in the Heart Sutra. But so, so the Buddha asks them, so bhikkhus, any kind of form, whatever, whether past, future, or presently arisen, whether gross or subtle, whether in oneself or external, whether inferior or superior, whether far or near, near, must, with right understanding, how is it, be regarded thus. This is not mine. This is not I. This is not myself. And he went through the same thing with feelings, perceptions, volition, consciousness, whatever. He went through all those things and as he taught them the same things. And so he then concludes this, and this is what I this is what I wanted to uh, to talk about. Um, because when a noble follower who has heard the truth sees thus, he finds estrangement in form. He separates himself from that whole idea. He finds estrangement in feeling. He finds estrangement in perception. He finds estrangement in determinations. He finds estrangement in consciousness. When he finds estrangement, passion fades out. With the fading of passion, he is liberated. When liberated, there is knowledge that he is liberated. He understands. Birth is exhausted. The holy life has been lived out. What can be done is done. There is no more. So what the Buddha was getting at here then is that we all have to separate ourselves from our feelings. And that comes to be when, um, let's say you have a friend, and your friend really does something stupid, and it, it pisses you off or whatever. When you're connected to whatever your friend did that upset you, that connection, when you internalize it, that internalization, that egocentric idea that he or she hurt my feelings, he or she pissed me off. When you do that, rather than recognizing that's his or her actions, it's not my actions, it's not me, it's his or her actions, not mine. When you can separate that from yourself, then you're not passionate about it. And when you're not passionate about it, you don't suffer from it. And when you don't suffer from it, then you don't become attached to those feelings. You don't become attached to those perceptions, those sounds, those sights, those uh, everything. 
So that's what the, the Buddha was teaching us in a form of non-attachment, of, of, uh, of seeing the world as it is, which is even that moment in time, that's when the rainbow existed. And when that moment of time passes, the rainbow stops existing. Same for ourself, same for that feeling of anger towards your friend, same for that feeling of, uh, of disappointment, whatever. So the Buddha was trying to help us learn to detach ourselves from these attachments to feelings and personalizing everything. So I, I use this just as an example because, you know, sometimes we applying the applying the teachings of the Buddha in everyday life, we wonder sometimes, uh, how do I really apply this and how my, in my life every single day? So I have an employee, you guys know I'm retiring, and I have an employee who had uh, applied for the position to replace me as the office director in my office, and he did not get selected. And another person from another office got selected. And he took it really, really hard. And he took it very personally, like, you know, they don't like me. Um, what do they have against me? If, if this is the way they're going to treat me and not promote me, then maybe I just need to look for another job. I've been your deputy for years, Tom. And they, and then, you know, the higher authorities that chose my successor, um, they, didn't, they didn't treat me fairly, blah, 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 blah. And I had this long conversation with him. And I said, Brian, do you see what you're doing? This is me, 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 me. This is, they don't like me. This is, they don't think I'm qualified. They don't think I can do the job. When in reality, maybe it's about something else. Maybe it's, we like that other person more. Maybe it's that other person has already run an office and they want that person to run this office. Maybe it's not about you at all. And you see, if he could just turn off this self-centered, egocentric, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all how I internalize my feelings, if he could stop that, he wouldn't be suffering. But he can't turn that off. And so he suffers because it all has to be about him. And I think that suffering is what, these are, those are his feelings, those are his impressions, his mental formations that he's made about whether he's the most qualified or not. They're all formations about self that the Buddha was trying to teach us. These lead to nothing but suffering. And those same concepts that you have in your mind are all impermanent. They're not going to last. That feeling you have now is not going to be as strong as the feeling you have tomorrow. And it's not going to be as strong. Uh, I mean, and the feeling you have in a week is not going to be as strong as the feeling you have now. They're all continually changing. They're all impermanent. But as long as we think of them as permanent, as long as we think of them as self, we suffer from them. And that's what the Buddha was trying to teach. So that was my discussion on anatta, the, the idea of non-self. So if you come across with nothing tonight and you ever hear, what is the anatta? What is this non-self that the Buddha was trying to teach? Think of it as a chariot or think of it as a rainbow. We give it name and form and we say, that's a chariot. That's the name and form we've given it. And yet it only exists because all the parts come together. Same thing with the rainbow. The rainbow is only there because all the parts came together at the right time and space. But as soon as that time and space is over, the rainbow doesn't exist anymore. And this person that I call Tom, when that time and space ends for whatever, Tom ceases to exist as well. I am not the same person I was 20 years ago. Not even close. You, I mean, you probably wouldn't even recognize me 20 years ago with my thoughts and feelings and and, and impulses and consciousness at the time. Um, but the Buddha teaches us actually moment to moment we're not the same. We are continually changing, continually impermanent. That's just the nature of being. So anyway, you guys have any questions about Anatta? You have any questions about Anicca or Dukkha? Tom? Yes. Thank you very much for that. I, I really enjoyed that. You did a great job. I have a question. I wonder if one could say that not self is 
very much akin to the concept of unborn mind or original Buddha mind that we are all born with. Wow. Okay. So that A is an excellent question because the concept of Buddha mind or uh, no, that's not true. The concept of Tathagata Garbha, which is there is inherent in each person a Buddha, uh, is a construct of Chinese Buddhism uh, in about the third century uh, of the Common Era. And it came about... Um, it came about in Chinese um, philosophical circles somewhat as a uh, concept to try to explain uh, Buddha nature and also somewhat of a concept to try to explain how each of us has the potential of becoming a Buddha. So there, some scholars have said, yes, there is a conflict between the Buddhist teachings of anatta, meaning there is no inherent self at all, uh, and the concept of Tathagata Garbha, meaning that nascent, inherent Buddha inside all of us. Um, some people have, some scholars have argued that that's not Buddhism. Here's how I have learned to deal with it. Because I've actually struggled with this a little bit. And uh, I've struggled with it a, a little bit recently because I was I am in the, in the process of taking a class at, at Buddha Dharma on the Perfect Enlightenment Sutra. And the Perfect Enlightenment Sutra has a lot to do with this Tathagata Garbha, which is that inherent, innate, inside everyone, there is this ability to become a Buddha. Um, here's how I deal with it. Um, There are skillful ways to explain things, and there are unskillful ways to explain things. Um, and I try to, I have tried to attribute that sometimes people have come up with difficult concepts and not been as skillful in explaining it, even though the concept may itself may be true. And so here is how I see the concept, and I try to explain it a little more skillfully than just the idea that inside each of us is this inherent eternal concept that we can all become a Buddha. And it goes like this. We all have inherent in every living being the mental capacity to form where we're going with our existence. And so, if the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and said to himself, I've fought with this long enough. I've starved myself. I have emaciated myself. I have kept myself awake for weeks on end. I've, you know, I've done everything I can do. I give up. I'm just going to sit under this tree till I figure it out or until I die. That's pretty much what the Buddha said when he finally sat under the Bodhi tree. When he dug deep enough inside himself, when he practiced strong enough his mind opened up for him. And I honestly believe that if you or me or Oscar or Marion or Val, if we practice hard enough, sometimes it comes quickly and sometimes it comes slowly. But if you practice, dedicate your mind strong enough, you can figure that out too. Is that an innate, eternal concept that lives within me all the time, it depends on how you define it. And I think that's what it really boils down to. I think all of us have the ability to concentrate our minds. Some people, some people don't. Some people are born with mental impairments, whatever, and they don't. Um, but most people, most able-bodied people have the ability to practice, to meditate. Some people can meditate deeper than others, but we all have that innate ability to do so. 
because that is just a characteristic of human nature, that to me is humans can become enlightened. And that's what the Tathagata Garbha is to me. Does it mean inside of me is a little Buddha? That just depends on how you want to define, I suppose, what types of skillful means you want to use uh, to describe what can a human being do. Um, and I think that's just one religious way that they've described it. Uh, so that's how I can, that's how personally I can balance the idea of anatta in one hand from the teachings of the Buddha to apocryphal sutras that were clearly written hundreds of years after the Buddha passed away and still say, you know what, there is truth there. I just have to understand how they were skillfully trying to explain it. And I use this as an example. If an enlightened person gives a message, it's going to be the same message as the Buddha would give, whether it's at the time of the Buddha or a hundred years after or a thousand years after. They would still be able to teach how to become enlightened. And by enlightened, I mean in suffering. That's, that's exactly what I mean, in suffering. Okay? To me, that's enlightenment because that's nirvana, the cessation of suffering. Okay? So if an enlightened person, having studied the Buddha's teachings or not, is able to then explain, this is how you too can end suffering, then it is still a Dharma truth. And so, for example, when Shariputra would come and he would visit the Buddha, and the Buddha's retinue of monks. The Buddha would say, Shariputra, the monks haven't heard from you in a long time. Would you give them a Dharma lesson? And Shariputra would acquiesce to the Buddha. And he says, oh, you know, of course. Um, and he would give a he would, And there were many times that Shariputra or Mahamogulana or Mahakashapa, they would acquiesce to the Buddha's request. And they would give a, they would give a uh, sermon, a, a discourse to the, to the monks that were following around the Buddha or to the lay people. And when it was over, the Buddha almost inherently said, Shariputra, that's exactly the way I would have taught it. Good for you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I could not have phrased it any better or any differently. And then he would tell the monks that. This is the lion's roar of Shariputra. Listen to him. He speaks the truth of the Dharma. And so if the Buddha says, those are the same words I would have used, yet they came out of another person's mouth, then I have to be able to say, if that's happening at the time of the Buddha, then if that same truth comes out of somebody else, then I just need to learn to skillfully listen and figure out what it is. So that's how I see it. Uh, yes, there is an argument within Buddhist theological realms as to whether or not that concept of a Tathagata Garbha is, is contradictory to the Buddhist teachings on Anatta. I think if you skillfully analyze it, then it's not inherent in Tom. It's not inherent in a self. It's inherent in a human being that I can figure out how to end suffering. And so it's not self to me. It is an element of humanity. That's how I see it. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you for asking the question and Tom for ans answering so skillfully. And everyone for listening skillfully. <laughs> Uh, it's 7.30 now, so if you guys want to recite the vows and call it a, an evening so as to respect other people's time. I mean, I could honestly stay for like 20 more minutes, but, you know. So, um, take it away, Tom. Okay, here we are. Four great vows. You guys can see this, I hope. Yes. Okay. The four great vows. Sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. Thank you all for practicing with me tonight and letting me have the opportunity to uh, uh, discuss the, the nature of existence. And I hope I didn't confuse anyone too much, but we all seek to end suffering. Our own. Great talk. Great talk. Thank you.
Thank you for your teaching. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Val. Good to see you questions. guys. That I have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, I'll stick around if you want to ask. No, no, no. I mean, I, I think you. I think you made made it like a things that I can ponder. Oh, good. Myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. It's it's a good. It was a good topic. Same. I, I feel the same way. Like I feel like I need to meditate on this or something. <laughs> excellent. Then that's that's the point, right? Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank that you. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. All right. Good night, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Next week. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.